nice to see you. It's more like an opening. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, but. Well, it's nice because, um, as Melissa likes to say, especially in terms of um, writing and talking, she's a little bit no frills. So I think the opportunity to get a little bit of um, frilled Melissa is a big draw, you know, like get everyone in the room to hear more about what's going on. I hope I can remember. We'll fill in the blanks. We all have to talk a little loud. Okay. 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 Can you hear us now? Okay. You heard about the no frills? <laughs> Just so everyone's clear about what to expect. Um, and for those of you who don't know me, I'm Gabby Collins Fernandez. I've had the um, pleasure of knowing Melissa now for a while and having um, a lot of access to her work and thinking. So we'll try to mine all of those fertile areas. Um, but I wanted to start out the conversation with something a little bit more obvious, uh, which is just to ask Melissa, why so many diptychs? Uh, okay. So, let's see. Well, um, when I first saw diptychs, I thought, why? It didn't make any sense. I couldn't think of why to make, just make a painting that size. One painting. And then, of course, I tried them. And then, I also like to do um, two paintings and try not to do all my ideas or um, visual ideas in one painting. So I try, I start like these two. I did, I started at the same time. So that's Summer in the City 1 and 2. Yeah, and seven. this was the first one. And, and at one point I even thought of putting them together and I thought, no, no, it's too much, too much. <laughs> and you, and um, so that's sort of uh, the way that I work. But then I also, um, I love the work of Joan Mitchell and her multi-panel paintings. So, and, and when I was in Provincetown a long time ago, when I was a student at the Provincetown workshop, the, in the art supply store, the man gave me a reducing glass, and said, John Mitchell used this a reducing glass. <laughs> so, but yes, I would get that. What does the reducing glass do? See, uh, oh, well, this is before, um, you know, cell phones and um, iPhones and all that. And you can see the painting, you can get back. If you have a small studio, like I was at any way, had a tiny studio, and I could get back. And also, um, it just makes you look at the painting differently, you know. But now I do, I use my camera, mm -hmm. and I photograph it in different stages. So uh, yes. this is, a, this is, I think this is really interesting, um, like the way that you talk about the reducing loss, especially leading from this conversation around the fix, is something that I've been thinking about. Um, read this question, which you had mentioned to me, uh, a couple of people had brought up to you, right, this idea of why diptychs. Um, and I started thinking a lot about how, um, a lot about like the logic of layering in your work. Um, and that's something that kind of John Yao talked about in his recent review. Um, the fact that there are sort of filters or layers of information that get stacked on top of each other. Um, and I started reading, uh, each of the gestures as their own iteration on a rectangle, and looking at the diptychs as two rectangles coming together to make a larger rectangle helped me understand that as a kind of framework, that in a way, like, the largest frame of the rectangle is maybe like the scaled up, very minimal version of one of the gestures inside the painting, and that each of the gestures inside has their own specific viewpoint into another world almost. Sounds great, but I kind of lost <laughs> That's okay. Um, but uh, I think... Uh, I thought it was great, but I don't know. Because I'm so, I'm so instinctive or improvisational mm -hmm. that, and I've, done, I've made so many paintings that over the years that I sort of have an idea where I'm going. Mm -hmm. You know, either... Um, as far as like, you know, the value, the, um, the color, 
the rhythms along the way. So. so where does that idea come from? Which, which idea? So when you're like, okay, for instance, the two Summer in the City paintings, right? right, right. When you're thinking about working them, like what, where, even if abstract in your mind, like where were you moving toward when you were thinking about, for instance, the color in these works? Well, first of all, I paint on the floor. So, um, and I start with the like kind of um, mix up different kinds of yellows and um, Naples yellows and warm and cool. And I just do it. I just make like a grid, but it's all improvised. Mm -hmm. And then, if this, both of them went through different um, stages, and I thought they were finished at one point, and then I thought, no, no. And, and a lot of times I would have to give up something that I really liked to make it better, to layer it. Mm -hmm. Like I'm looking at something like in this one, where I remember I loved the gesture I made, but then I, it wasn't enough, and it didn't work with the whole painting, so I had to do something over it. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of like adding. There's no subtracting, but there's a lot of adding. So you would see the idea of a mark on top, even if it obscures something that went below it as ultimately additive. Yes, um, yes, right. Yes. And so, so maybe that's what you're saying about the layering. Yeah, I think that has something to do with it, as well as this kind of like very um, both like tightly energetic and super tenuous relationship between all the parts and how they stack up into the rectangle. Um, that like you know this idea of enough as it relates to one gesture seems to has to, seems to have something to do with like the overall energy of the work. Um, well, I'm also thinking about like when I did those um, large murals for the, um, that building in Tokyo, mm -hmm. Shidomi, and how it was the one that had, that was 40 by 50 feet, and <laughs> Dinah's laughing because she worked on it with me, <laughs> and it had 35 panels, and I had to <coughs> go left to right, up and down. Mm -hmm. So in a, in a way I'm doing that here, I'm watching how the certain colors are moving around, up and down and around, so. And like the containment of each specific <coughs> gesture becomes almost modular, right? They're each kind of their own thing. Um, right. And thinking about that, I started, uh, I started thinking about the relationship between um, <coughs> uh, gestures as characters, like in letter form, and how that does and doesn't relate to characters as personality, you know? But, but I think letter forms originated from the body. Like the, if you, right? The Explain history. that, please. What? Explain what you mean by I think um, original um, fonts or letter forms were, um, came from the body. Or like early glyphs like and their yeah, relationship yeah. to um, like pictures, like pictographs or something like this, or in certain kinds of languages, like the Korean alphabet is, uh, originates in the shape of the mouth as it articulates certain kinds of letters, although that's super abstracted um, at this point. But, um, so yeah, I was wondering if you could talk more about gesture in the work and the difference between um, gesture and this idea of a character or of a glyph or the similarity between them. What's a glyph? A glyph, like um, uh, like a, a hieroglyph, like a, a small kind of unit of uh, meaning. <coughs> so could you ask the question again? <laughs> um, in your works, the the work appears to be. I think in some sometimes the work you approach it, and it appears as though there's this kind of gestural all overness. And then as you get closer, you realize that each of the gestures is in fact pretty circumscribed, right? Like there's a, um, you know, like a light blue squiggle and then a red squiggle and they kind of occupy their own, they occupy a very determined space. So the idea of fluidity is also countered by um, a kind of prescribed geography almost. 
So, okay, well, one thing I wanted to say about these two paintings in particular, and they're the last ones I did, I was thinking a lot about the Dubuffet show mm -hmm. that I saw this spring. And, um, and I even thought about, and I've also been doing um, collages of, um, and we actually have one here, right? I think Jill's going to go get it. Anyway, um, of where I cut up my watercolors and reassemble them. And so I think that was like feeding into this, also into these two paintings in particular. So, um, and it's interesting, the, the, the two what I call white paintings, if you trace them, they would be the same kind of shapes. We've now um, entered the show and tell portion. <laughs> <laughs> So this is a collage. <laughs> 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 we can here. <laughs> we can put it here. <laughs> here. And I also brought my <laughs> sketchbooks. <laughs> Wait, hold on. Okay. Let's see. Which, um, which I do on residencies. Should we just lay them out? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. And my favorite pages. Okay. And this one I did in Cassis, France. Um, and I feel like this, what we're doing right now, is kind of also related to the ethos of your paintings. Which means, like, like you have a lot of different things in your pocket, like, and you're ready to kind of bring them out in a painting <laughs> when they may be appropriate. Well, um, are those collages? Yeah. yeah, and I, and I almost think they're kind of, like this one I think, oh, that would make a great mural if I had a chance to do, you know, where I could combine um, transparent glass and ceramic tile or something like that. Yeah. Um, have you done a subway? What? Have you done a subway? No. Okay. Yeah. Other, well. people, other people in this room have. <laughs> <laughs> like Leslie Wayne. You will. Okay, from your mouth. Before I'm too old. <laughs> so. so you're talking about collage and the way uh, how these works, um, how these works have a kind of collage sensibility, even as they're all painted and just applied yeah. paint. It's kind of interesting to me to think of um, collage and gesture, which seems. Um, like kind of against, you know, like two kinds of forms that don't really work. But I think, um, like the, I was going to show something else too. Um, it is um, Carla Akati. Oh, we have printouts too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we can pass those around. <laughs> great, great. So, and this is a favorite artist of mine. I only talk about dead artists. Um, and let's see, Italian, but I wanted to show one thing in particular. Oh, this, this is, so it's almost, I don't know if everybody can see, but it's almost like these gestures have been like stilled. Okay. Right? Who's the artist? Carla Acadi. Who is? Jeffrey. Oh, okay. So, um, I'm going to pass this. Sure, we can, yeah. we can start that one. And Italian, she was the only woman in this group of Italian artists in Rome. She's called Forma One, which is right. a mid century sort of um, modernist Italian group, abstraction, largely. Here's one of her murals. And I'd like to someday do some more research on that. And so, here's another one. We could pass this one. I was going to ask you to revisit this idea of a stilled, stilled energy inside of gesture, and no. like return. I know we're going to like get back into this question of collage. Um, it's all right. We don't. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. then, then we'll be into femage. 
Which is, yeah, which is one of the points, right? Right. So another nice parallel between, for instance, your work and Carlo and Cardi's is that despite not looking as though the subject matter is related to social issues, and specifically feminism, she and another Carla, Carla Lonsi, right. in fact, um, published a number of articles in Italian about feminism, sort of second wavy, uh, type feminism, uh, feminism's writing that had to do with like uh, restructuring essential questions of femininity and womanhood and a rejection of patriarchal society, etc. Um, and of course, you in 1978 uh, collaborated with Miriam Shapiro on the article Femage, um, which had to do with uh, a rewriting of the history of collage to include um, crafts and other kinds of <coughs> not traditionally art forms. And I was wondering uh, if you could talk a little bit. But also saving and um, recycling and reusing and memory and all the kind of things that maybe um, we don't associate with like Picasso and Brock. Oh. So collage not necessarily being a question of formal, um, a formal or only spatial consideration, but collage as a way of being able to literally bring memories or like saved scraps onto a piece of paper onto the work and like letting the kind of remaining like uh, the air or the like the ether of that content to allow that to enter into the work a little bit just because it's present. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. How does that work in your work, Melissa? <laughs> You mean memory? Yeah, sure. Okay. Um, I have an observation. I think the collage, the density of the collage is very different than the compression space. A little louder. The density that of uh, all the markings and shapes is different and much, uh, it's much denser in collages than right. in the larger works. Right. And I right. think it's an interesting play on reading left to right in a, in a triptych or a diptych, and then reading back and forth in a collage. And so it, it seems like another way to disrupt the space and uh, bring those unexpected shifts within, within the whole structure. Well, it's also interesting to me that um, when I first explored collage in the 70s, I wasn't doing watercolor. So now, I'm a late in life watercolorist. And in the 90s, I started to do watercolors. And um, kind of that's influenced my painting also. <coughs> and, and I always thought that I was going to get to that because um, I love the last works of Arshil Gorky. And I was always like hoping to get to that free state that his work had. And I think through watercolor, that helped. I wanted to ask about okay. that, about transparency, because I feel like it gives you a kind of a limitation, right? If Since you're committed to always being transparent, the color is always transparent, or, or semi-opaque to transparent, you, you have to keep the white available, right? You can't, you can't start over. And I feel like we sense that as a kind of a limit, that the painting has to happen in the first few layers and that's it. There's a kind of a, a deadline at the back. But I wonder, that, that's how it strikes me. Maybe. Right. But right. I wonder, too, like, once upon a time, your work was full of opaque paint and could layer and layer and layer in a kind of more conventional way. But now I mix you white. have this restriction. Well, but I don't think of limitations as a bad thing. So, um, I mean, I think of, like, in the Renaissance, the um, artists, all they had to do was, they were given the subject, all they had to do was a better mother and child. Like we, you know, we have, we have to do everything. <laughs> and talk about it too. <laughs> I think they were just talking about it to like the king. It was it. <laughs> they just didn't have a big audience. Right. Well, that's, oh, well just kind of following on that, like you're, um, sorry. But, because I wanted to ask about your, you know, your 
you, it's additive, it's nothing subtractive. Is it, is it, is it, maybe it's obvious, but does that come together with your late watercolor work? I mean, that, that, was, that sort of answered my question. Yes, okay. yes. And I also think of like a performance, you know, um, and I sometimes, sometimes I'm just not in the mood to work because it's so performative, you know. So I have to like get, get myself in, you know, in shape to do it. You also I love know. dancing. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I feel like that's sort of um, one of the less remarked um, analogies in your work, like how much these works um, have a relationship to dancing steps, like almost like a map of movement or something yeah. like this. Interesting, yeah. Um, and sort of bringing it back to diptychs, I was just thinking about how we all have two feet. Um, and like, you know, doubling is something that I think is something that you think about a lot, right? But doesn't necessarily end up in the work all the time. And the diptych is a way of thinking about like bilateral symmetry and have, you know, we have two hands, we have two feet, movement right, that happens right, here, two, and eyes. Have two eyes, exactly. Right, two ears. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Leslie and then. Um, I just wanted to. I was thinking that there's an interesting connection between what you were saying about transparency and what you were saying about memory. Right. Because really, all the transparency is allowing us to to see through to your process, which is building. I mean, every gesture leaves kind of a memory. Um, I think something that, um, like, related to this, Leslie, too, is the idea of, like, uh, rehearsal, almost. Like, when you rehearse a step and over and over again, and dancing, memory, exactly. and this idea of gesture as muscle memory, not necessarily of gesture as expression, and this thing which is very rigorously done over and over again until you can become expressive in, like, surprising new ways under the auspices of like adrenaline and performance as opposed to like because it's Tuesday and you feel sad or because right. it's Wednesday, right? right. Um, but I also have a favorite quote from Louis Pasteur. Um, Accidents favor the prepared mind. And Accidents what? Accidents favor the prepared mind. And sometimes it's, it's a, in French, sometimes it's chance, not accidents. So and it's interesting from a scientist to have that concept. But Morris? Um, a couple of questions. First, how long does it take to a painting like that? Decades. That's <laughs> <laughs> the whole cumulative experience. <laughs> I don't know. Um, well, let me think. Really? How long it took? Well, I don't know words. Is it, is, is it a one act play? <coughs> It's a oh, it weeks, months. It, it was probably a couple of weeks for each one, and but it's but it's. Um, I think it's more a movie than an act than a play. Right. And Why, Melissa? <laughs> what's the what's the difference between a movie and a play in your painting? <laughs> Something to do with like film noir and the, the amount of light and dark that goes on. And, and also how you view it, you know. But okay. I, and one other question. Uh, when did your obsession with 90 degrees start? When did my what? Obsession with 90 degrees. <laughs> like the, the, the way that there are lots of bright angles? <clears throat> yeah. Oh. Oh. I, th I think it's probably urban. It's probably being <clears throat> in the city. And um, this summer was, I was basically in New York all summer. I visited a couple of friends at, in the country, but it was basically in New York. And I, and I actually had a, a hope to have a new landscape in my future. <laughs> um, so we've been talking a lot about like the structure of these paintings with all of the layers, but I was wondering if we could for a moment talk about the two other large paintings that are a little bit more, um, there's one fewer, or there are only two sort of visible layers. There's the under sort of irregular grid, and then the over layer, which, is, which are the black gestures. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, 
those and how you how you came upon that kind of a setup, how you feel they're different. Um, well, there's also another painting in the front mm -hmm. um, that's dedicated to my um, yoga teacher who died. Um, but these came out of my um, black and white drawings that I do in watercolor. So, um, and then I wanted to like scale them up. I mean, they're mostly small. Mm -hmm. And so... Um, in a way, those seem to like... <coughs> as I was thinking about your relationship to someone like Dubuffet or the idea of collage, those seem to point to those like much in a way that's very explicit because these shapes are carved out um, in a way that you can kind of read them as this jigsaw puzzle that doesn't make sense. Right. Because right, um, right. if I were to cut up the, the space of the black lines and then try to like build it back together with the color underneath, like they would all fall apart, right? There's not a stable ground that you could do that with. Right. Um, right. <laughs> but those have come for me to, to represent the way that you're thinking about linear composition and abutment um, in the work as opposed to something like speed. Um, right, right. right, and the varying speeds of different brush work or some, uh, different brush marks. But there's <laughs> also, I always find myself sort of letter forms. In, in those also, and I and I know um, there's stories about de Kooning starting with writing a word and, and working from that. Are there like secret messages for us? Find <laughs> <laughs> <Why? laughs> it. Yeah, yeah, sometimes I have to get them out. <laughs> Joe, yes. I still can't get over. I haven't gotten over the fact that you work on the floor. I know. With long brushes, long and, it, brushes. and it actually came out of doing the Tokyo project, mm -hmm. which I had to work. There, there, there was no way I could um, like paint them. It's so I had to do them in parts, and then I had to photo <coughs> the parts and all of that. So, so all that of these are done on the floor. The little ones too. The little ones. <laughs> really? <laughs> So Melissa, do you have a ladder that you go up to the top to be able to get sort of a view removed from your paintings? Yes, I get on. Yes, yes. With and with the reducing glass and the camera and the whole, you know. Wow. I hope I can. That's why I have to like keep doing yoga. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Even if you paint on the wall, you have to keep doing yoga. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> right. But doesn't that have to be with well, not, doesn't that have to do with not wanting drips? Yeah. Yes, oh, so I didn't want drips. And then when you do lift up your painting, what, once it's done, is it a big surprise to you to see it facing you as opposed to from above like that? Does it feel different? Well, um, since I don't live in my studio anymore, it's been interesting to like work and leave and and worry about what have I done, you know, <laughs> and then go back and and be able to pick up the painting because it's and see what I've done, and sometimes it has to go back on the floor. <laughs> Is there an up and down from the beginning, or does that do you decide that later? What do you mean? An up and a down, like a the orientation. You know, orientation. Oh, um, well, I remember with this one at some point I thought maybe it's a horizontal. So I had it this way, and then I didn't, wasn't what I wanted. But does that, are you thinking about what, I know there's a painting on the floor, is there, do you have in mind what is up, or does it matter? Or do you just sort of let that happen, and at the end, this looks better this way? Do you know what I mean? Like, is, is there like some sort of gravity thing? I start, or? I start with where I think it's going to be the top. I don't want to have to have too many give myself too many problems, uh -huh. right? Yeah. Well, I could also see how you wouldn't think about it at all until the end of just kind of go, okay, yeah, let's put it this way. I don't know. I mean, it, like in other words, if it, if it affects your your gestures or something. Well, because you're moving around the painting the whole time, right? All the way around. 
Do you, do you feel like you're writing or you're painting? Writing? I might go back to a jar. I might decide I need, um, you know, another. Another that. But initially, <laughs> initially, when you first lay down the uh, you go, right? And then you may decide you want to add more later on. Right, okay. It, it, when, you, when you say that you, you uh, paint on the floor, to get these gestures, is it a body movement or an arm movement? It's both. It's both because I'm moving. Right, you know. And it's, it's interesting because you think of like um, drawing could be just hand and then it could be arm and then there's the whole body, right? Mm. And well, this is somebody should videotape you make a thing. Yeah. And it should be showing right here. <laughs> <laughs> it would be interesting. Right? Okay. Glass. 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 I think when I did the Tokyo Project, I think when I did the Tokyo Project there were some people filming, but I don't know what happened to it. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm not sure that I still understand following up on Dennis's question <clears throat> how you approach the totality of the surface that you're engaging with. Whether you've got a loose quadrant demarcated and then you come in with the turquoise or the blue and hit a couple of quadrants within the same um, time period and then shift to a different color or gesture. Um, are you, in other words, are you working the entirety of the surface at the same time, do you feel, or are you kind of working a la jump close, you know, where he works top to bottom or left to right, whatever? Um, so maybe, I mean, I would have to look at the pictures that, you know, the sequin pictures that I took of these two paintings, but I think at one point they were larger areas, mm -hmm. and then I made them smaller, mm -hmm. you know. And if I could just follow up with a slightly unrelated question. You spoke of, of, of dance. One of these paintings, I, I think, is called Jay Mulligan. Um, I think it means Jerry Mulligan, which is I know, I mean, G. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, but um, as, as someone who loves jazz, I, I'm just curious the, the, whether, you, whether music actually is a function of, of how you're painting. In other words, are you listening to, to music? specifically in any kind of way, not necessarily to relate it exactly to gestures or color, but that it provides a certain kind of energy, maybe even rhythm, uh, as you're working. I, I, I feel that. Am yeah. I, no, no, I definitely listen to music. It's, uh, and it's... It's integral. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Do you have all your colors mixed before you start? Um, not exactly. Not exactly. <laughs> but, but you do have kind of other I have an idea. I have to start. Yeah. If you paint in a cup rather than on a palette, like if you keep your paint in a, if your brush is like a container rather than on a palette. Because yeah, it's so they're in jars. And that came out of the Tokyo project also, where I had to mix up really large amounts of paint. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Are there different sized brushes, or is it one brush? No, they're still all different size. Mm -hmm. yes. Mm -hmm. yes. So I know something that you talk about often also um, is wanting to manifest, make visible a certain kind of energy. Um, and I was wondering if we might talk a little bit about um, like the relationship between this energy in your work and a kind of elegance that's also inside the work? <coughs> so did we talk, we, we covered this, I think this week about elegance, which became um, like <coughs> criticism of Jackson Pollock's work in, in the 50s where they photographed um, a fashion model in front of a painting, right? And, and that became, I think that was a marketing tool for them to call it, say it was elegant, mm -hmm. right? Um, but wait, what's... But then we were sort of also, um, you know, we were also talking and I think, you know, something in your work, um, in the fluidity of the gesture, in this relationship to dance, you know, when we talk about movement, elegance obviously means something very different than when we talk about fashion, right? And we were talking about how it is that your work, how it is that the, the gestures in your work end up um, communicating a kind of um, 
like a kind of unworked quality, right? The idea of how labor does or does not appear. No. Um, and like, you know, for, for the dance distinctions, it might be like, are these like Nureyev type paintings or are they Baryshnikov type paintings, right? Does the work, does, right. is the work sort of like sublimely effervescent or is it more muscular? Does, you, does it let you see the sweat in a certain sense? I think it's more Fred Astaire than... Leslie had a good term, but it's a for it. But I was going to say um, something about... I forgot now. I was going to say something that Leslie and I talked about in, in the interview that she did with me. Um, what? Right. Yeah, but there was something else. Spreza Dura, which Leslie can sort of sum up. It just means that it's sort of like, you know, I didn't want to put this in, in uh, writing, but it's sort of like Dolly Parton, which <laughs> yeah. said, we got to Dolly. it takes a lot of money to make you look this cheap. Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> but, and, we, which, and, and I said to you that I, I obsessed and I worried and I struggled on these paints, but I didn't want it to look that way. Yeah, and they don't. They look very... Why? Why didn't I want it to look that way? Exactly. Yeah, like why? Because I think of somebody... I, th I think of somebody like Matisse when he was in his 80s and he's in a wheel wheelchair and he's making these beautiful collages and there's no sign of the pain that he's in or the suffering and... I think that's a very positive thing for art. Tell me more, Melissa. <laughs> <laughs> it's a sort of transcendent quality. What is the, I mean, you know, it's sort of, it's a very interesting question because it runs like historically counter to the way that we think about expressionism, right? Or the way that we think about, um, you know, not, not too many of the people in this room because we look at a lot of art and we know that these distinctions are very facile and whatever. But um, the idea that you would be um, sort of editing as well, right? That there's another kind of limitation placed on the work based on um, not, just the, not just what you're working with, not just this transparency, right? But also in the end that you would want someone to be carried away by the work, right? Instead of being um, reminded of their suffering, right? right, right. Um, What's wrong with that? There's nothing wrong with it. It just seems to me that this is sort of like a foundational paradigm of your work, even though you might not say that you had thought about this analytically in these terms, right? Right, right. Exactly. Um, but it's a tradition of sublime in landscape. Sure, it, it has a long, it's not like Melissa invented it, but she sure is using it, and it seems like this is an interesting and sort of relevant way to think about gestural painting, right? Or this is an interesting way to think about um, abstraction, like a kind of very practical and yet also sublime way of thinking about this relationship between part and whole and color and luminosity or something like this. Can you raise another question? Um, so, you know, some of these paintings are very open, uh, like, and some are very, like, crowded. And am I to infer that you're, the ones that are open, you were happier with them right from the beginning, and the ones that are crowded, you had a lot of doubts and you kept working on it until that resolved, or did you set out for some of them to be more open and some? I more set out. I said, uh, to see if I can get away with it. <laughs> like in the, what? I, I wanted to ask more about crowdedness, which mostly they feel crowded and kind of jubilant in their crowdedness. And um, they fill up the rectangle. And then each unit also, the brush stroke fills up its allotted in, in space. These, yeah. In these, not, not in every painting, but right. most of them, that's often true. And I feel like you you allow us to kind of compare unit to unit how your brush decides to, to fill up its allotted space. But it's rare that there's one like the one on the left hand uh, middle side there where the kind of um, violet gray leaves quite a big open area. It almost feels like, I, I wondered whether that was the one where you're thinking I could have done a little more there. <laughs> the one... The the one below. Uh, yeah. The two below. Uh, yeah, 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 that one. So, but I liked it. 
But that process of kind of filling up, in, it, on one hand, it allows us to compare and see the virtuosity of, of the changes you, you make from location to location or kind of room to room to room within these big building lots. <laughs> but it also means that there's a kind of anti-compositional result that we don't, we don't get to compare them in terms of some overall immediate look. But what we see roughly is <coughs> similar fullness. Is there a question? No. Okay. <laughs> um, also, if like this is true, there's this sort of anti-compositional visual element in the work, which is also which runs counter to a very compositional sort of energy sense in the work, right? That you would, as you step back, have a sense of how each part creates a kind of vibration or something like this, and then be able to relate to the composition in that way as opposed to in this more sort of programmatic visual sense. But, but to pick I up know. on that, I just want to, I, I think that's a really interesting comment. I was thinking about that a lot because the grid holds still, if, in spite of the gesture and the color, there's still a way that it holds to the grid. And what interests me is that painting straight ahead, which has a uniqueness. The gesture and the drawing it's very bold. I mean, it's very, it's a very tough painting, I think. And it's really amazing to think about that painting as being something that's done in one shot. Like, there's no place where you can go wrong there. You have to be really intensely focused. And the gesture becomes a really unique form there. It's not just one mark over another, a gesture over another. It, it has a kind of character to quality of the line there and to the form that, that it takes. It's really, uh, I think it's one of the strongest paintings. Thank you. Thank you. It's also Appreciate all of that layer, the top layer is all black. Yeah. <laughs> so it kind of unifies it in a different way. Um, and actually that was an interesting comment um, that Alexi made about filling. Um, so, I mean, do you think of your, your painting process as, a, as each painting is a way of filling the the rectangle. I mean, it's sort of like, you know, some people paint over and change things and move things around and stuff like that, but your process is in fact a filling process. That, you know, it's done when the whole thing is filled, which whether it's filled in a crowded way or a small way, it's never like halfway, you know, it's always filled. And it, it is sort of filling, that idea of filling, is that an idea for you? No, exactly. No, no. But I'm going to think about it now. Well, the way I think um, sort of this idea of filling is perhaps like contrasted with the idea of landscape, as Iona was talking about it, and the idea of these as kind of like abstracted representations of urban life, or like thinking of some of these as like having a very ecstatic dance party on a subway train at rush hour or something where like everyone is like only allowed to be here but we're still having a great time <laughs> um, and that uh yeah I, I wonder if like i wonder if the idea of filling and the idea of um representation don't sort of work against each other, right? That the ultimate goal might be a, a representation of a sense of density that you already know, or that you're kind of working toward. Does that make sense? No? I think filling is a strange word. Yeah. Yeah. It, it sounds it seems like, like yeah. As though there was nothing, and now you have to put more stuff in it. Well, isn't the size of the unit determined by how much paint you can hold? Um, do you double dip? No. <laughs> <laughs> well, I remember when I worked on, like this one is lighter. It's, it has more air. And, and this one is denser. And, and some of the um, brush strokes are even fatter, right, than in the one, in this one. And, and I like that, you know. I mean, I like to have the variation, too. And I'm going to do some more related to these. I have a question. 
Okay. Is the black on this down in one shot? Mm, not exactly. No. And I also mix up different blacks. Okay. Like warm and cool blacks. Okay. In that one painting. Both of them. Yeah. So you don't necessarily start with the phone no. <coughs> until it's done. You you might stop and take it up again and. What did you say? Have a drink. <laughs> Anybody else? There's a question back there. Yeah. Hi. Thank um, you, Melissa. I, I'm glad that you're going to be looking at doing more of these. Um, as I look around, I, I see that they all have, even you know, the wide range of colors we have, they all have a really sense of lightness about them. Even the, the heavy black seems to be just kind of floating there. And, uh, something that um, I, I noticed when I first saw the show, and it just, it's amazing how light you've made everything. I know energy was referred to earlier, but this seems really like it's floating, it's really enjoyable to see. We are coming up to the, the time where we have to think about wrapping things up, so if there are a couple more questions, now is the time. Just gonna, we went to see Twilight Tharp the other night, and it was, um, she offered a, a, a commentary, she was speaking, and, and, and then there were dancers, and she showed her, it was sort of a commentary on her dissatisfaction, her history with minimalism, and, and the history of her dance, and she showed a lot of notes and graph paper, and you know, her, how she learned how to make notation, and so just getting back to the difference between the two kinds of paintings, because it reminded me a lot of, just not only her graph paper with her little, marks in different areas, but um, how then, then she would show how it became a dance and how each figure had its own space. Mm -hmm. And so where you see that. These are so similar to her diagrams. <laughs> That's yeah. interesting. Have you seen well, them? No. I, mean, she's, no. I mean, she just has piles. I mean, she's like crazy. I, didn't, I knew she was, but I didn't know she was that way. Right. right. And, and she just, uh, yeah, she, she diagrammed everything everything in different ways and it's really interesting you know i mean it's you would love to see that so especially when since you mentioned this was more like dance than writing yeah. anybody else have um, you seen any love art i can't hear love art notation have you seen any of it so it's a whole structure of the choreography contemporary or modern choreography mm -hmm. to map you know uh, very specific um, non-narrative mm -hmm. So can I ask a question? It, getting back to the color, it seems like at the bottom layer, it's your color is very kind of light and atmospheric, and then the second layer is a little bit darker and more coloristic, and then the top layer is where the darks are mostly right. Is that about compressing the space, or is that what you're... I mean, you, I'm don't just, put, you don't put black in the background and, and light colors no, in the front. No, and I'm echoing the watercolor process. Yeah. But, but I'm going for kind of um, visual drama. Yeah. I could say that. What? Noir, right? It's a yeah, little more than you write. These are called Sun And is that because you started with yellow and then the sun? No, Sunday. no, I didn't know what to call them. Okay. And then I thought they were after, it was after the fact. Yeah. And then I thought, oh, somewhere in the city. That's what I did. <laughs> yeah. And I even looked up the lyrics to the song. Okay. <laughs> Anybody else? Charlie, did you want to ask you a question? No. <laughs> I have one thing to say. I think they're incredibly intuitive and lyrical paintings. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Yeah.